Hi, I'm Coach Cowland, and today we're going to be looking at measurement. So, first thing we need to do is answer the question, why should we measure? Now, in order to measure, it's uh, the reason why we measure is that it's important to understand our results in a quantitative manner. And looking at the values that we get from the data that we've found. This is a way that we can use to check that our experiments give us the results that we need. The way that we measure in science and engineering is via a system called the SI measurement system, which is an international system of units. It's used by scientists and engineers all over the world, and it is the metric system. It is not the imperial system that you may all be used to. The metric system is broken up into these main base units. Now the base units are like the key units, they're the ones that all other measurements come from. So length in the base unit is meters, mass is in kilograms, time is in seconds, electric current is in amperes or amps, temperature kelvins, the amount of a substance, which is something you'll be very you'll become familiar with in more in chemistry, is moles, and the intensity of light is a candela. And on the right hand side of this table you see the symbols for each of those units. One thing that is important to note is that some of these units are in lowercase, such as seconds, and some of them are in uppercase, such as the amps. It's important to remember that these stay as they are, they are like that for a reason. There are other units that come from base units. These are called derived units. These are done by combining some of the base units together and these give us other measurements. So an example would be a speed. Speed is distance divided by time, so it's meters divided by seconds. Um, and the derived unit for that is meters per second. So these are non-base units, derived units. Now, sometimes the units that we have, the SI units that we have, are much bigger or much smaller than we need to. And the benefit of using the SI system is that we can just move the decimal point to the left or to the right and add a prefix to it to accommodate it. So if I add the kilo prefix to something, I multiply it by a thousand. A kilometer is a thousand meters. If I add a deci prefix to it, I divide it by 10. I end up with a multiplying factor of 0 0.1. And I just add the letter to the front of the unit. So kilometer is km, decimeter is dm, centimeter is cm etc. Now this, using these I can choose which prefix and which multiplying factor is most appropriate. So I wouldn't measure a paper clip in kilometers, I might measure it in centimeters, but it would be most accurate in millimeters. So that is what I would use to show my workings in. This is something that you're probably going to need to write down. This is a way of converting between SI prefixes. The, the example given here is from meters to millimeters. So there's 1,000 millimeters in one meter. So if I had a measurement of 1.45 meters, I would multiply by 1,000 divided by 1. So I'd be effectively multiplying by 1,000, and that would give me 1,450 millimeters. Some of the derived units that we cover and talk about include things like volume and density. Volume is the amount of space something takes up and it's a measurement of length times width times height. Effectively it's length in three different dimensions and the derived unit for it is meters cubed. Meters times meters times meters. Uh, the density is the mass divided by the volume. Mass is in kilograms, volume that we've just calculated is meters cubed. So its derived unit is kilograms per meter cubed. That's kilograms for every cubic meter. The SI unit of temperature is the Kelvin and the Kelvin scale is a very interesting scale 
The zero degrees Kelvin starts at absolute zero. That is the point where there is no more energy and you cannot get any colder. This is a lot colder than the temperatures that we're used to. In fact, to give you some idea, the point where water freezes is 273.15 kelvins. And the boiling point of water is 373.15 kelvins. Usually we work between those two values, so most of our values in kelvins would be in the hundreds of degrees. And the good thing about the Kelvin scale is that there is no negative value. So you're always dealing with positives. References. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. So what I need you to do is go back through it, make notes on everything that we've covered, complete the examples, check that you understand them, write down any questions that you have, things that you would like to go over in class. I'd like you to think of at least two, and be prepared to continue on working on this in class, and I will see you then. Goodbye.